The Night Beat starts right now. Hot is hot, and, and, and you have to be mentally prepared to fight fire on a day like today. They face the flames in record high temperatures. The Northside apartment fire where animals and their owners were saved. Coming up, but first. An abrupt closure for several polling locations just hours before tomorrow's election. The Bear County Elections Department citing challenges amid this pandemic. Some polling locations already had to be moved because of some election judges expressing concern for the virus earlier in this election. Today, some election teams chose not to serve because of the virus, meaning three polling sites will not open tomorrow. Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan released a statement saying in part, quote, Please keep in mind that the average judge's age is 72, so we certainly understand their concerns, end quote. Here's a look at the list of closures. They include Cameron Elementary, Storm Elementary, and Corbett Middle School. All of those sites will have signs redirecting voters to other voting locations. Despite the closures, there will be 214 polling locations available tomorrow. You can find polling information and take a look at sample ballots right now on our website. Just go to ksat.com. A little more than 55,000 people participated in early voting. Tomorrow, contactless voting procedures will continue for the primary runoff election, and voters are encouraged to wear masks. You can catch all the results on the night beat tomorrow night. Coronavirus cases continue to rise in big numbers in San Antonio. Just four months into our crisis here at home, our death toll now nearing 200 people. Let's take a look at the numbers tonight. We had another 11 deaths reported today for a total of 195. When it comes to cases of coronavirus, our new total tonight sits at 20,213. More than 7,000 people have recovered, but more than 12,000 remain ill. Here's a look at the hospitalizations. Just 10% of staffed beds are available. Tonight, 1,267 people are in the hospital. 421 are in intensive care. 257 on ventilators helping them breathe tonight. It is a grim, grim reality. People are dying, and it's not just COVID-19 patients. Hospitals and morgues are simply running out of room. Mayor Ron Nirenberg revealing tonight that refrigerated trucks are on standby in case we run out of space. We saw this happen in New York City at the start of the pandemic. The night team's Tiffany Huertas with how the rising number of COVID cases and deaths are impacting hospitals. It's a hard thing to talk about and people's loved ones are dying, but um, in the hospital, there are only so many places to put bodies of the loved ones and we're out of we're out of space. Refrigerated trucks are on standby in San Antonio. So we're looking at ourselves for refrigerator trucks to put bodies and to hold them until the, the morgue or the funeral funeral home can come pick them up, which sounds terrible. But it's true. The city reported 11 new deaths today and 565 new cases of COVID-19. That's in addition to the 18 deaths over the weekend. If these numbers continue in the same direction as they have been over the last couple of weeks, we're, we're going to be forced in a situation that nobody wants to see, which is to shut down activities. We can stop that if we work together. Locals have mixed opinions about another shutdown. On one side, you definitely want to keep people safe. And on the other side, you definitely want to um, help folks who are having a hard time uh, bringing money in, uh, earning income and putting food on the table, essentially. I don't think an additional shutdown or a rollback is necessary. I think it's going to really hurt businesses. Um, I think people, um, they can't support their families. Um, they can't support their livelihood. I think it's going to do a lot more harm than good. I think if everybody wears the mask in public places, some of the establishments can open safely, uh, but we, I personally think bars cannot open safely. Dr. Ken Davis of Krista Santa Rosa says to help make hospital beds available for those who really need it, some COVID-19 patients who aren't severely sick are sent home with oxygen and are monitored. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. This pandemic also posing a problem for those suffering from and trying to combat addiction. One nonprofit has seen a surge in overdoses and people needing help with substance abuse. Tonight, we're going to speak with Avita Marine from Rise Recovery coming up in our live KSAT Q&A. It'll be later in this newscast. 
Well, tonight's big story, hot is hot, and that is exactly how San Antonio Fire Department's Chief Charles Hood described the unbearable conditions this afternoon as they worked to put out a major Northside apartment fire. It happened at the Parliament Bend Apartments off of Parliament Street. The night team's Jaffney Gray with the rescue efforts of both people and animals in the extreme heat. They came out here one time and they thought they put the fire out. Boo. They had to come all the way back out here and all this happened. Tanjanika Rolniak says she was in the building next to the 24 unit building that went up in flames this afternoon at the Parliament Bend Apartments. We caught her and her sister handing out waters as San Antonio firefighters spent hours knocking down the inferno. The fire had gotten up in the attic so we were able to cut that building off with the eight units and to keep the fire from progressing into the rest of the attic. But that was a concern of ours because if that would have happened, we could have lost the whole entire building. With temperatures reaching 107 degrees, fighting the fire was no walk in the park. Absolutely uh, brutal conditions to fight fire in, the heat, humidity, wearing 60, 70 pounds of equipment. Chief Charles Hood says it was also difficult accessing the building engulfed with flames. It's very narrow back there. We weren't able to get a lot of the equipment that we probably need back there, so we're having to bring everything up from the street. The fire department says no one was hurt and every resident is accounted for, but that was not the case for pets. Fortunately, fire crews saved several, including Kelly's three animals. Just pure joy, and now it's just that they're alive, and now I'm just worried about if any like damage, smoke damage or anything. Chief Hood says fighting fires in these hot temperatures at this exact point in time is not the only obstacle they're up against. He says we're still in a pandemic which has impacted his department. My firefighters are still working in pandemic conditions and several of them that I saw earlier were in our first group that had COVID. They're out here working today. They had COVID a couple of months ago. Eight units were destroyed by fire. 16 are inhabitable because of smoke and water damage. I would just like to say um, we're not lucky, we're blessed. Japhne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Now, firefighters had to shut power off to part of that complex as they fought the blaze, more than just the part that was on, on fire. And while it forced many people outside, VIA buses brought in to help shield people from the extremely high temperatures. Our crews on scene noticed more VIA buses added to the area throughout the afternoon. Temperatures today beating a record for our area. Meteorologist Sarah Spivey tracking it all for us, Sarah. Yeah, it was a very hot day. Record smashing high temperatures. We reached 107 degrees in San Antonio, which not only is a record for the day, but also the hottest we've been in San Antonio since 2013. Look out toward Del Rio. The high temperature in Del Rio, 112. That is the that ties the hottest temperature ever recorded in Del Rio. So a very hot day for all of us across the KSAT 12 viewing area. It was also a CPS energy uh, saving day and here's the numbers in that we saw between the hours of 3 to 7 p.m. Residents saved 240 megawatts of energy be between about 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. That helped out the power grid. One megawatt of energy is enough to uh, power 200 homes. So altogether, CPS energy customers saved 48,000 homes worth of energy. Tomorrow is another peak energy demand day. Uh, we'll try to lower our usage between about 3 to 7 p.m. Now the reason why it's a high demand day temperatures once again going to be very hot breaking records across the KSAT 12 viewing area. I've got a look at those temperatures as well as a recap of the hottest day so far this year and the hottest day in seven years in San Antonio. ECs. All right. Thank you, Sarah. The high heat leading to cooling centers in the city. Face coverings and social distancing will be required. Those taking shelter from the heat will be screened for possible COVID-19 symptoms. It's in an effort to keep people cool and out of any dangers the high temperatures could pose. KSAT.com has a complete list of locations for the 28 cooling centers around the city, including nine branch libraries with extended hours. She's believed to have been abandoned in this intense heat. A woman in her 20s found dead on the south side along Jet Road. Now the Bear County Sheriff's Office is looking for who was responsible. What we believe is that this young lady is, a, is the uh, is, was traveling from Honduras and she was on her way to Houston. That woman is believed to have crossed the border in McAllen before making her way here. Bear County deputies say a family member called them to say the woman was reported to be left on the side of the road after becoming unconscious. 
Investigators say she may have passed out due to heat exhaustion. And another death in Military City, USA. That death is happening at Fort Sam Houston. Joint, pa Joint Base San Antonio says the identity of that service member who died is being withheld until a next of kin is notified. They did, however, say the U.S. Army soldier was found dead yesterday on the military facility. The U.S. Air Force Security Forces and the U.S. Army Criminal Investigation Command are looking into the case. Still ahead on the night beat, a religious statue set on fire in front of a church. The monument to the Virgin Mary now scorched. The message one church leading it is sending tonight. And the pandemic here at home impacting air quality levels. What research is showing coming up. And a Black Lives Matter mural vandalized. The incident all caught on camera. We're going to hear the confrontation next on the night beat. Well, it was all caught on camera. A man vandalizing the Black Lives Matter mural in front of Trump Tower in New York City this morning. Red paint was thrown on the letter V in the mural, but as cars drove by, paint was smeared. NYPD had to shut down Fifth Avenue to clean up the paint. Investigators are also reviewing security footage of the incident. It developments in the search for actress Naya Rivera, who disappeared in a California lake last week. Her son found alone in the boat, and today authorities recovered a body from the lake believed to be Rivera's. The discovery made in Lake Peru, Los Angeles, and comes five days after the Glee star disappeared. Surveillance video shows Rivera's last moment seen alive. Her four-year-old son found by the boat vendor alone on board, drifting in the lake about three hours after it was first rented. Her son told investigators they went swimming, then his mother boosted him onto the boat from behind. He told investigators that he looked back and saw her disappear under the surface of the water. Investigators believe Rivera mustered enough energy to get her son on the boat, but not herself. Her former co-stars joining her family members today at the water's edge Holding hands, the body found in heavy brush, 15 to 20 feet high, which made it difficult for divers to find her. Authorities say there is no indication of foul play or suicide. Well, it was a process of closing and reopening. Tonight, we're getting a look at the effects of the stay-at-home order in San Antonio. Local experts say a drop in air pollution led to improvements in people's health and could lay the groundwork for changes in city, in city planning, that is, in the future. The night team's Patty Santos talks to a UTSA scientist about what the San Antonio pollution data revealed. This was all particulate matter, so dusty particles. And the most significant trend was our African dust that we all witnessed uh, a couple of weeks ago. UTSA professor Dr. Afamia Elnikot compared ozone, particulate matter, and nitrogen dioxide pollution in two areas of San Antonio since the start of the year. In the nitrogen dioxide plots, you can see January, February, March, and here we go, a sudden drop in mid-March that continues throughout until today. Data shows a drop in vehicle emission pollution around the time the stay-at-home order kicked in. But when compared to 2019 data, she says it's not unusual to see less vehicle pollution in the summer when school is out. But what's different this year is this drop didn't happen in May and June. It happened back in March and April. We're seeing uh, people not be as easily triggered for respiratory symptoms, in particular asthma. Allergy and immunologist specialist Dr. Erica Gonzalez says lower emission pollution led to better health for some of her patients. In the peak of oak season, most folks were indoors. Their symptoms uh, were much better controlled, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that they were just spending more time inside. Dr. Elnicott says there's no significant changes to ozone or particulate matter pollution. Based on what the pre- and post-COVID-19 pollution data showed, she thinks a deeper study, including other environmental variables, could lead us to rethink how cities grow. We need to rethink the parking lot, rethink the infrastructure, rethink scheduling, rethink activities for our kids. It's Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News.
Live cam tonight as we look outside, it's still 93 degrees, yeah. but hard to believe that's cool oh compared to what yes. it was today. Well, and you know, Stephen E. Cease, it really doesn't feel that bad now that the sun has gone down. But when the sun was out in full force, we were experiencing heat like we've never seen in July before in San Antonio. And that's not hyperbole. Literally temperatures climbing to 107 in San Antonio today. That is the hottest July temperature on record since records have been taken since 1885. That's 135 years. Of course, we've had other days of hot weather back in 2000. We got up to 111, but that was in August, not in July. So let's go ahead and take a look at these high temperatures around the area. Very impressive. Keep in mind that our average high this time of year is 94 degrees. So we ran about 10 to 15 degrees above average, got up to 109 in New Braunfels, 111 in Catula, 108 in Uvalde and in Del Rio. It got up to 100 and 12 degrees today. That is significant because for Del Rio, that ties their all time hottest temperature ever. Yeah, very impressive to see that in Del Rio earlier today. 104 for the high in Rock Springs and all of us were sizzling, especially down near Catula, where it was 111. Now, one of the reasons why we were able to heat up so quickly today was because of the low humidity. Dew points were in the 50s in the afternoon for the majority of us. But notice that dew points are starting to go up a little bit as we get that southeasterly breeze. So by tomorrow morning, we'll have a humid start to the day. But right now, it is still fairly hot outside. It's 93 degrees. However, with the breeze and the low humidity, it just doesn't feel that bad outside. If, in fact, after the night beat, if you want to step out on the patio or in the porch, you'll notice it feels pretty nice, like a regular summer's evening. But it's still 100 degrees out in Del Rio and 97 in Laredo and in Carrizo Springs. So the reason for the heat is the high pressure system. High means dry. We are under the influence of a heat dome. And the way I like to describe this is like a magnifying glass that intensifies the heat in the summertime. And that magnifying glass is positioned right over us in San Antonio in Texas. Across the state of Texas tomorrow from this heat high, high temperatures are once again going to be impressive, potentially record breaking heat. In Lubbock, it should be right around 111 degrees, Midland 112, Del Rio 110, Abilene 109, and here in San Antonio, probably going to get to 103, which once again would break another record. Now, it's been a long time since I would ever say 103 was cooler than the day, but it is cooler than 107. Still going to be dangerously hot though tomorrow. We'll start off with a few clouds, 77 degrees, then we'll become mostly sunny into the afternoon. South winds at 5 to 15 miles per hour. Uh, and again, not going to have much humidity in the afternoon tomorrow, so kind of what you see is what you get when it comes to the temperatures. No heat index during the afternoon, and once again in the evening hours, it shouldn't be that bad with low humidity. However, 103 degrees is still dangerous even if we don't have a heat uh, index. And in fact, there is another heat advisory in effect tomorrow for these counties in orange here between the hours of 1 p.m. and 8 p.m. That's the peak heating hours of the day. Temperatures will range anywhere from 102 to 104. Uh, and then after that, we'll start to see a trend down in temperatures. It's been a long time since I thought 97 would feel good, and it probably will on Friday. However, with that high uh, humidity returning. Once again, we're going to have to worry about the heat index value. Now, one of the reasons why we'll be able to dip down to 97 on Friday is because we'll have a small opportunity to see a passing shower or storm. We're going to call it about a 20% chance that heat high is going to weaken enough to uh, potentially bring us a couple of spotty showers on the radar. So you may get a free car wash by Friday, but uh, that's an 80% chance it won't rain in San Antonio mm -hmm. as well. So Steve ECs, hope you're staying cool, guys. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. All right. You know, the NBA has a lot riding on what's happening right now in Orlando, Greg. And they reported today the league and the Players Association said of the 322 players who reported to the bubble, only two tested positive for COVID, never got into the bubble, went home to quarantine. Russell Westbrook telling us today that he has suffered from the coronavirus. He is remaining at home for the time being. But we're going to take you inside the bubble where the Spurs, Patty Mills, and Derek White talked to us today. Big changes at the University of Texas coming up.
We are going inside the NBA bubble tonight in Orlando to visit with both Spurs guards Patty Mills and Derek White following their workout at Disney World today in Florida. Both of them were asked about the one hour team meeting before their first workout over the weekend at the Wide World of Sports Complex hosted by head coach Greg Popovich where teammates shared their own personal stories about social injustice before the Spurs get down to the business of restarting their season. Yeah, it was probably the, the best uh, way we could start. Um, I mean, it's obviously a topic that everyone is um, not only so passionate about, but directly involved in. We were able to hear people's stories, um, people that were willing to talk um, about the stuff they experienced personally. Uh, so you just get to know some people a little bit more than you knew them before. And um, I mean, just come together as a team, um, having the same common goal, which is to make the world a better place. Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law Firm. Big announcement coming out of Washington today is team owner Dan Schneider has decided to retire the Redskins nickname and logo. The team issued a statement earlier today in which it said a review that had begun on July 3rd and wanted to keep our sponsors, fans, and community apprised of our thinking as we go forward. And as a result, the Redskins name and logo will be retired. Schneider for years has resisted a name change of the Washington franchise and carried for 87 years. But more pressure was brought to bear by sponsors following protests over social injustice. The reason why a new name was not revealed today was due to trademark issues, but some of the names being mentioned are the generals, veterans, monuments, senators, red tails, and warriors for now. After meeting with student athletes and sharing their concerns about social justice, UT officials have announced several major changes going forward. First, the field at Darrell K. Royal Memorial Stadium will be named after the school's two Heisman Trophy winners, Earl Campbell and Ricky Williams. This comes at the request of Joe Jamel family that previously bore his name. At the same time, a statue will be erected to Julius Whittier, who is the Longhorns' first black football letterman and a graduate of Highlands High School here in San Antonio in 1969. University of Texas interim president Jay Hartzell also says the eyes in Texas will continue to be the school's alma mater, saying aspects of its origin, whether previously widely known or unknown, have created a rift in how the song is understood and celebrated, and that must be fixed. But players who do not want to stand on the field while the song is being played will be allowed to go to the locker room. Now, one of the student athletes demanding changes on campus is former Steel High School star Caden Stearns. The junior defensive back was just named to the Chuck Bedard Award preseason watch list as announced by the Maxwell Football Club today. The award is given out each year the most outstanding defensive Defensive player in college football. Stearns has played in 22 games or 21 starts and last season appeared in nine games missing four due to injury, but he still managed 58 tackles, 23 solo, four tackles for a loss, one sack, and it broke up, uh, broke up a pass. He was a Big 12 Defensive Freshman of the Year, joined, by the way, on the watch list by his teammate Joseph Osai. The UTSA Roadrunners have made an official former Judson High School star Julon Williams has signed his financial agreement with the university and after two years in Houston is joining the Roadrunners. Williams, who is now a wide receiver, must sit out the 2020 season per NCAA transfer rules, but will still have two years of eligibility left starting in 2021. He's also the younger brother of Jarvin Williams, who is UTSA's career rushing leader who played between 2013 and 2016 and is currently a graduate assistant with the program. Julon was a standout dual threat quarterback adjustment between 2014 and 2017, throwing for over 6,700 yards, 60 touchdowns, and rushing for another 3,369 yards, and an additional 58 touchdowns with a record of 42-12 and 12 as a starter. High school's back on the field today. Next. Today is the day the University Interscholastic League is allowing summer strength and conditioning camps to continue. One of the first to hit the field today, the Alamo Heights Mules. And remember, it's not just for football players. For all student athletes have been sidelined for the last four months since the UIL shut down all sports during the state high school basketball championships here in San Antonio in March. And again, when school districts started pulling the plug two weeks ago when the COVID-19 numbers spiked, now they're back in the field under new head coach and athletic director Ron Riddiman. Any chance we get to come out here uh, and we're following the guidelines, uh, we're keeping them away from each other, they're wearing masks when they're not actually doing the exercises, uh, and I think the guidelines have proven to be effective. And so we were excited to get back out here bright and early this morning uh, and just see how this goes going forward. High school football season slated to start with the first games on August the 27th. First game for the Alma Heights Mules are having to use Comalander Stadium as their home stadium this season due to construction on the Heights campus. Kickoff on August the 28th at Bernie. Diana Wisdom, the mom of Judson's Bryce Wisdom, will be on campus this Wednesday from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. at the entrance to the Performing Arts Center building to sell these shirts. Live like Bryce as Bryce continues to try in his recovery from another round of chemotherapy 
uh, chemotherapy after his cancer return. Donations are also being accepted. We'll do anything we can help Bryce with this fight. Yep, Bryce Strong. You got it. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Still ahead, a statue of the Virgin Mary found scorched outside a church in Boston. The message one church leader is sending tonight. And they've seen an increase in people needing help with substance abuse amid this pandemic. Tonight, we're going to speak with Avita Marine from Rise Recovery. It's next in our live KSAT Q&A. KSAT Q&A, a part of the show where we take our questions and your questions to some of the local experts. And this pandemic has certainly taken a toll on the economy, taking a toll on a lot of people's health, but also on some people's mental and physical stability. And we're talking about addiction and the problem of addiction tonight. Avita Maureen is the CEO of Rise Recovery. They just had a big groundbreaking this morning that we'll talk about a little bit coming up. But what are you seeing the effects on uh, substance abuse during this pandemic? Well, our focus is on youth, young adults, and their families, and so we are seeing that those are often underrepresented uh, people in this pandemic around addiction. People don't realize that they, with kids out of school, having been out of school for a long time, they've got a lack of oversight and uh, more idle hands than normal. And so uh, we're seeing kids get into things that uh, at a rapider pace, at a more rapid pace than they normally would. And that's scary because they might run into the law instead of in you know a detention or something. So the consequences are much more serious. You know, Ms. Mori, any agency or company has challenges that are unique to them during this crisis. Can you talk to us about how COVID has complicated how you provide your services? Absolutely. So we we are normally a community center. We provide services at no cost to uh, to our community who are experiencing recovery or want to experience recovery. And instead of being able to serve them in community, we've uh, completely gone virtual. Now all of our support groups and our peer coaching uh, and even our social activities have become online, virtual, and we're intaking people that way as well. So uh, we've seen the same amount of people, which is alarming, but the need is there. Uh, even though, and uh, we continue to be available by phone, by text, by computer, however you need us in a way that's socially safe. But but RISE isn't a treatment center per se, correct? No, no. we are really the best place to go after treatment. So if anyone has experienced a treatment facility, a high level of care, the hardest part of that is after you leave, you normally have to jump back into, especially if you're a student, a young person, the same people, places, and things that that you came from, the same neighborhood, schools, job, and, and a lot of that might be associated with your use. And so uh, with Rise Recovery, you can come to us and learn how to be amongst other people, other young people who are in recovery and work with peers, uh, professional peers who have been in recovery for the long term and build your plan about how to live life in a joyful recovery way. You know, everyone is under a lot of stress during this pandemic. Can you talk to us about some of the warning signs to look out for, either something that you may notice in yourself or perhaps in someone else? Talk to us about some of those warning signs that you may think that somebody needs to seek treatment and then how to go about getting that help. Right. So uh, for, for substance use, it can be a slippery slope. I think a lot of it is that pressure. If you feel like you would like to quit because you don't see that it's uh, having value in your life or the consequences are outweighing the benefits, and yet you still feel pulled. And um, saying that you're going to commit and then not being able to, if, if you're finding that the consequences, uh, that it's causing more harm than good and then you're doing it anyway. You know, those are some signs that you might have a problem. You might want to talk to somebody about it and uh, just get an assessment and see if you need more help than you realized. Uh, talking with other people who've been through it is a really uh, great way to start. And at Rights Recovery, everyone is in, is in long-term recovery. That's one of our peer coaches. So uh, they know the journey and they know how to help you. What should parents look for? What should they be on, on alert for in this pandemic? You know, uh, one is that if you have someone, a loved one in recovery or in addiction, uh, first to take care of yourself because there's so little you can do about someone who's, you know, really off the deep end and struggling with addiction and the behaviors that encompass that. But, um, you know, one of the things that our youth point out to us is that the apps, the social apps, the uh, cash apps, the uh, rideshare apps, those are all avenues um, to to find drugs, to to purchase drugs, to have it delivered to your door. Uh, you know, so pay attention to what's on your phone, to, on your kid's phone and, and what they're using. And also 
be in relationship with your kid. This is a wonderful time since you are in isolation and surrounded by family more frequently to really lean in and find out what your kid's going through because they need peers. And we've heard more than more than once that young people are they're willing to have bad friends than to have no friends at all was one of one of our peer coaches shared with us. And so uh, making sure that they have access to good, healthy friends uh, as an alternative to to those negative influences. On a positive note, Steve mentioned the opening of the facility today. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yes, we're so excited. Uh, we have a two acre uh, uh, plot of land that we have broken ground on. We will officially be building this this summer, a beautiful 22,000 square acre facility, a recovery campus. And uh, you know, we've lived out of borrowed space for our entire 45 year existence. And the time is now, especially with COVID and with the mental stress at its height for us to share with the community that we are uh, that we are here, that we have a presence in San Antonio, and that we will accept uh, anybody who's a family or young person in Bear County who needs support in finding that for drug and alcohol uh, use. There's such a stigma around you know getting help. You know, a lot of people realize that th that's one of the best and strongest things you can do as an individual is re is admitting you need help. We have the number on on our screen right now, two ten. Say care. Talk about that twenty four hour hotline and why people should call it. So this is a this is a really special uh, helpline. It's unlike any other that exists, and that it is a collaborative effort, United Way funded by uh, Rise Recovery, Alpha Home, and Lifetime Recovery, all and uh, Pay It Forward, all nonprofits who have covered the lines twenty four seven, um, three hundred sixty five days of the year. And uh, you will reach another person who's usually in long-term recovery themselves and can walk you through what resources are available in Bear County to you. It's a warm, it's a it's warm human being on the other side. It's someone who will hear you. It's someone who will help you and uh, get you the help that you need if that resource, if you're in Bear County and you don't know where to start. Evita Morin, CEO of Rise Recovery, thank you so much for your time. And congratulations on the groundbreaking. Thank you so much. Thanks for staying up late with us. We'll be right back. Around America tonight, a blast on a Navy ship under investigation tonight. At least 57 people injured on the San Diego based vessel over the weekend. They were treated for heat exhaustion and smoke inhalation. The explosion happened as the ship was undergoing routine maintenance. The Navy says the fire will likely burn for days, leading to unhealthy air levels in parts of the San Diego metro area. Flames scorched a statue of the Virgin Mary outside a church in Boston. Police say plastic flowers that were placed at the religious statue were set on fire. Father John Curran says the statue was placed there just after World War II, welcoming back soldiers from the war. He's hoping whoever is behind the arson case will come forward. There's too much division, too much hatred, too much, you know, beating each other up. We need to keep pressing, pressing, pressing the issue of reconciliation and unity and peace. Church officials say they will clean the burn marks off the statue. Neighbors were able to replace the flowers that were destroyed by the flames. A 37 year old military veteran died of coronavirus complications in Ohio. Family members say Richard Rose was very active in helping homeless vets and in preventing veteran suicide. Friends say they were crushed by his loss, but also hurt by a Facebook post by Rose back in April. That post saying he would not buy a mask and that he made it this far by not buying into the hype. Rose's family says he tested positive for COVID on July 1st and died just three days later. More disappointing news as America battles this ongoing pandemic. Right now, deaths are on the rise in almost half of the United States. Some of the hardest hit areas are considering reinstituting shutdowns. And as the World Health Organization touts a number of potential vaccines being tested, they still warn we have a long way to go. ABC's Trevor Alt has the latest from New York. The numbers in the fight against COVID-19 in the United States are growing grimmer by the day. Today, 39 states in Washington, D.C. are seeing increasing cases, 31 states have rising hospitalizations, and 23 states, nearly half the country, are reporting a rise in deaths. My plea uh, to our community and especially all of our young folks in the community is to take it seriously, wear your mask. Florida announcing 12,600 new cases today, the second highest total behind Sunday's 
as 15,000. Some city leaders in the state now considering shutting down once again. Uh, the percentage of people who were testing positive has finally started to decline. We'll see if that's a trend or whether that was that'll be something that is short lived. As cases rise in California today, Governor Gavin Newsom announcing the closure of all indoor dining and bars statewide. A lot of these activities that were happening inside, uh, like restaurants, moving those activities outside, uh, the impact uh, of the spread of the virus. Uh, outside, uh, we believe, is more favorable. Dr. Lewis Tran, who volunteered in New York City in the spring, warns that while they've had time to prepare in California, the hospital system could get overwhelmed. There's a lot of fear and trepidation among my staff and among the hospital in general. A lot of us are still nervous that the surge will eventually outstrip our resources. As scientists race for a vaccine, the World Health Organization says globally more than 100 potential vaccines are being studied in laboratories, with 23 now moving on to human trials. But they still warn we're a long way from the light at the end of the tunnel. I want to be straight with you. There will be no return to the old normal for the foreseeable future. And here in New York, where they continue to ask travelers coming from out-of-state hotspots to quarantine when they arrive, today Governor Andrew Cuomo says those travelers who don't provide their contact information will be hit with a $2,000 fine. Trevor Alt, ABC News, New York. And of course, the big news today, just how hot it was. I thought the weekend was hot. Then we hit Monday. Oh my goodness, today we got up to 107 degrees today, but there were areas around San Antonio that were even hotter than that. And some people have been talking about how, oh, well, yesterday felt hotter. Part of that is because we're acclimating to the heat, right? And the other part is it was more humid during the day yesterday, and that heat index definitely came into effect yesterday. But this was the story across many a backyard around KSAT 12 viewing area. This was in Seguin earlier. This thermometer hung correctly in the shade. It's never a good idea to hang your thermometer in the sun. You'll barely get a good temperature reading that way. This thermometer in Seguin showing around 109 degrees. And then someone in Holotus was able to get one of those laser thermometers and test the temperature on their deck nearly 180 degrees. This is why we say it's never a good idea to walk your pets, your dogs out in the peak heating hours of the day on the asphalt, on the concrete. Their poor paws are going to go on this 180 plus degree uh, heat. And so please, please, please avoid, if you can, being outside for a long time during the afternoon tomorrow when we'll have another heat advisory. Here's a look at the beautiful sunset from earlier today. At least it looked pretty, but it was hot outside by the time that sun set. 107 was the record in San Antonio, smashing the high record set back in 2013 of 102. By the way, 107 is the hottest we've been at all around San Antonio since 2013, and 107 is the hottest July temperature on record. Very impressive, these high temperatures, especially considering that the average high is 94. 105 in Kerrville, 104 in Rock Springs, 109 in Cruiser Springs, 111 for the high temperature in Catula, 105 Gonzalez in Hallettsville, and in Del Rio, 112. Once again, reaching the hottest temperature ever recorded in Del Rio. By the way, records in San Antonio have gone back since to 1885. That's 135 years of data. And we just smashed records today. 93 right now in San Antonio, but it feels okay outside because we have low humidity. 88 in Kerrville, still 100 degrees in Del Rio. So if you're wanting to enjoy a little bit of outdoor time later on this evening, maybe on the porch or patio, you should be able to feel nice outside. The reason why we are so hot is because of the heat dome that's in place. This heat high beating down on us, and tomorrow it's going to do it again. Between the hours of 1 and 8 p.m., we're going to have another heat advice in place. We'll start off with some clouds and then quickly warm up uh, with total sunshine in the afternoon. South winds tomorrow at 5 to 15 miles per hour. Tomorrow is a CPS energy peak energy demand day. We're going to try to lower our usage between the hours of 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. tomorrow because the power grid is going to be stressed. And some ways that you can do that is make sure
sure the lights are off and don't use appliances between those hours, etc. Now temperatures are going to gradually fall into the upper 90s by the weekend. However, humidity is also going to rise. So although we haven't had to deal with a heat index today and we really won't have to deal with what much of one tomorrow, it's still going to feel very hot in spite of the temperatures being below 100 degrees. We'll cross our fingers for an isolated shower or storm on Friday, but unfortunately, Stephen Eces, that is the only chance for rain and it's pretty mm. wimpy. <laughs> too bad. I know. It is too bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sarah. The summer trips to the beach a lot more complicated this year. While many people are skipping it and staying home, others are wanting to get away. From your sides, Marilyn Moritz with what you should know before you go because COVID-19 is not taking a vacation. At beaches across the country, surf's up, and so are the rules. But plan ahead because rules can vary. For example, at South Padre Island, city beaches are open, but gatherings are limited to 10. And leave the shade tent at home. As their Facebook page shows, only single pole umbrellas are allowed and a two chair limit, and spacing is 15 feet apart. As for face coverings, take one to any beach. If you're set up at least six feet away from anyone not in your household, you may be allowed to remove your mask. The CDC says take it off to swim though, but remain socially distanced. If you decide to go for a walk or anywhere where you might come into close proximity with other people, always make sure to put your mask back on. Plan ahead for food and bathrooms at some beaches, concession stands and public toilets and showers may be off limits. If the parking lot or the beach look too crowded and you don't think you're gonna be able to stay at least six feet away from other people, it's probably best to turn around and go home. There is a way to see the beach conditions before you go, live webcams. This is South Padre Island's website showing me right now the conditions on North Beach. Bottom line, keep safe distances and plan ahead or your getaway may be no day at the beach. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. And we have links to some of those webcams looking at Port A, Galveston and other beaches right now on KSAT.com. I mean, they're on there right now, but yeah. you're not going to see much right <laughs> yeah. now. Well, it's been used to treat <laughs> hair loss and rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, but could stem cells also help combat COVID-19? What one San Antonio doctor is saying coming up next. We've heard about convalescent plasma helping in the fight against COVID-19, but what about stem cells? One San Antonio doctor is taking a closer look. Courtney Friedman explains how the stem cells work and why they're expected to make a difference when it comes to the coronavirus. It's a common question. How in the world can stem cells be used to treat issues from hair loss to rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and now possibly COVID-19? Mesenchymal stem cells have a unique ability to transform into multiple different tissues. So they turn off inflammation and they turn on immune regulation. San Antonio doctor Derek Guillory is the principal investigator for three different trials studying stem cells and COVID-19. He's working with Houston-based stem cell research company, Celtex. Two of the studies already approved by the FDA will use a patient's own stem cells, harvested from fat cells in their stomach or hip, grown and multiplied in a lab, and then re-injected into their body. It's your own tissue. So there's no chance of rejection. One study will test if those stem cells can prevent COVID-19. The second will determine if they can treat patients who already have the virus. Stem cells have already successfully treated similar viruses that affect the lungs. There are a few trials, mostly from Asia, that prove a very big benefit. Dr. Guillory will soon begin choosing patients for the trials. The catch is it takes weeks for harvested stem cells to multiply enough to become effective. So he has to choose patients who have already banked their cells. That can cost thousands of dollars, but he hopes if the trials succeed, the cost will drop dramatically. Dr. Gilroy's third study is pending FDA approval and will inject COVID-19 patients with another person's stem cells. So if somebody is is diagnosed with a COVID-19 and they meet the tr criteria for the study, we could enroll them, we could give the treatment starting the next day. Either way, he's confident these studies will be successful in proving the key to beating COVID-19 may already be inside of us. 
Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Well, if you're interested in banking your cells or being a part of these clinical trials, we have information on how to contact Celtex on our website. Just head to KSAT.com. We'll be right back. 11-year-old Holly Morgan from DeKalb County, Georgia, putting her sewing skills to work during this pandemic, making masks for local hospital workers. When new mandatory mask laws went into effect in some areas of the state, Holly wondered how that might impact homeless residents. So she's once again at her sewing machine. So far, she has sewn 580 masks, her goal to eventually complete 1,200 new face coverings for the community. That's awesome. Yeah, way to go. That's it for the night beat. Don't forget. Oh, wait. Don't forget about the heat. <laughs> Don't forget about how can I forget about the heat? I mean, it's hard to forget about it, right? We were no, at 107 yeah. today and we'll be at 103 tomorrow, starting with a few clouds, but ending up sunny. South winds at 5 to 10 miles per hour. We do have a heat advisory in effect tomorrow between the hours of 1 to 8 p.m. That's when it's going to be most dangerous to be outside. So if you can find a way to stay cool between those hours and then looking ahead, dropping down into the upper 90s by Friday. So some relief there and an isolated shower storm possible on Friday as well. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, take care of one yeah. another out yeah, there. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Good morning, San Antonio at 430. Good night.